right? So I guess we I guess we go through the hot sun um, through the summer until we start to threaten the fall TV schedule, right? Which still makes a lot of money for the broadcast networks, and they start to freak out and they you know push uh, push Ted start. Sarandos and the rest of them back to the table, um, mm-hmm. and we make a deal that preserves the writers' room, um, codifies it into our MBA. We make a deal that ensures that late night and daytime writers are paid the same and have the same protections on okay. streaming as they do on television. And we uh, protect screenwriters from free work by making sure they get paid weekly instead of their payment being held until the very end of their contract, which allows the producers to force them to do endless rounds of free work. Um, it were, it, you know, we solve those issues. We ban AI. We, we uh, improve our residuals. Um, but most importantly, we put in place the protections that ensure that this will be a livable career for a long time in the future. Um, we're not just in it for the dollars, we're in it to protect like the existence of our very career. These gays, they're trying to murder me. What do I think of her? Yes. I don't think of her. Welcome back to Eating for Free, legendary people. We have a truly all-star lineup today. Um, my name is local gossip Joan Summers. I'm getting right into it for the very first time ever because <laughs> we are in the midst of chaos, confusion, and mania, and we don't have a lot of time to waste. Who are you sitting across from me on FaceTime? And this is your local artist and Matthew Lawson. Very happy to be here on this seminal episode. And here on Eating for Free, the podcast recording live from the absolute edge of the internet, we have brought back for i is this i think this might be your first ever main episode as like an official co-host i think that's I think right we, yeah yeah we did patreon but we haven't done on the main feed yet welcome everyone our producer ashlyn who has been on a little bit of a sabbatical because of work ashlyn hello hi hello, hello welcome it's Thank funny you. that your work has actually finally brought you back to us. <laughs> yeah. For a topic that it you took, are the most qualified to talk about. It took me away pretty hardcore. Um, and now for reasons that will become obvious, it has slowed down a little bit. So that's nice. <laughs> your first break um, in a very long time. Honestly. Yeah. I want to I want to set the mood off really quickly by just letting everyone know that it is officially almost summer again. And... We are recording in our hot, stuffy rooms, and there might be a point in this episode when I just start crying because of how sweaty I feel (laughs) with the windows shut. (laughs) So just brace yourselves for that. Um, I also want to just officially issue an apology to Lawson for the first time ever on this podcast. I'm apologizing for something I've done, which is I have joined an elite group of people that I have shut you out of known as (laughs) bluesky.xyz. Here we go. You lose your blue check mark and you gain a blue sky account. It's the order of things. Sometimes yeah, the cast system never leaves. Blue check to blue sky. Yeah, blue check yeah. To blue sky. And funny enough, most of the people that I'm seeing on blue sky are yep, like yep. blue check mm-hmm. exiles. That's what I thought. The elite <laughs> the blue check never will, inter- did you guys, will never integrate with the commoners. Like you can't. Did have you guys it. see those that New York that New Yorker story today where it was like the New Yorker was profiling these people who've all been canceled and they call themselves like the canceled brigade or something like they call no, themselves. No, it was something stupid. much worse than that. Oh, yeah. Oh. Why were you reading I was that? Gonna, why would you do I was that gonna, to yourself? I was going to, I think they might have called themselves like the keyboard warriors no, or something. No, no, no. Like, Wait one second. It is, oh my God, because it was like so that's bad. That's very upsetting. I'm sorry to them. I, I read it and I did not make The thought it. criminals. Thought oh, criminal. it's over, it's over, it's over. <laughs> <laughs> no way. And the worst Enjoy the grave was, you dug yourself. Like, no, so my, my favorite, I want to read this tweet that, um, speaking of thought criminals here on this podcast, we really are truly a gang of thought criminals. The writer, Emma Green, wrote, quote, Hanging out with Pamela Pereski's thought criminals made me think a lot about how we as a society figure out our boundaries for acceptable behavior and ideas and what happens when some people lose trust in those boundaries. America is deep into its debates about cancel culture. Pamela's group is one example of a different way of being willing to make community with people who might say or do things you find intolerable for better or for worse 
they, it's like they just discovered society exists. I mean, I'm like, did you exists. did you not go to preschool? You didn't learn boundaries, like and not, that people no. don't follow them no. and they break They're, them all the time. To be kind and to not say things that you wouldn't want someone to say to you, and like to not like touch people when they don't want to be touched. Yeah, I love that they, they are no, truly they probably positing them. <laughs> they are positing themselves as like the very first Neolithic people that like discovered murder might not be a good idea. They're like. You know, we maybe shouldn't bash each other's skulls in with this wooden club while, you know, home from chasing dinosaurs around. Like, maybe that's a bad idea. They're like, we are the very first humans in society to discover fire. And like, <laughs> yeah, I was going to say the next, the, the like, follow up article is going to be on like harnessing fire. Like, <laughs> like, it's almost, almost too funny that while we are here on this podcast being niche internet micro celebrities with blue sky accounts and good opinions, the rest of the world has like retreated into like a martini bar in Midtown to talk about that <laughs> one time a teenager on the internet called them a loser because they wouldn't let them say slurs. Like, <laughs> it's really the diverging paths. Um, well, thinking about people we despise. Uh, speaking of the thought criminals and more, mm, mm-hmm. um, the thought criminals of society at large, aka writers, um, <laughs> have universally <laughs> gone on strike. Um, they've gone on strike from dealing with the bullshit of Ted Sarandos. They've gone on strike from being underpaid by Paramount+. Plus. They've gone on strike from their residuals being $8 for an entire Maybe year. more, yeah, like three cents. Yeah, three cents a month is uh, the salaries some people have been living on. And the Writers Guild of America West has said, fuck off, and we are fucking striking, and we are in strike season, baby. Um, Solidarity, obviously, this episode is going to kind of be giving a little bit more of a backstage peek at what has been happening on the other side of the industry. While the writers are on the picket lines, obviously, people in boardrooms and executives and people's assistants and agents have all had lots and lots and lots and lots of opinions, some good, some mostly terrible. And we're going to be kind of diving into what has happened since the strike, what has led up to the strike. And Ashlyn, who works in an unspecified position in the <laughs> Ted Lasso <laughs> writer's room, as I think you said. <laughs> no, I'm joking, I'm joking. Ashlyn has a job that puts her extremely close to the action in a way I find frankly alarming from the <laughs> stories that you have told me um Absolutely. we're gonna leave it at that for ashlyn's job yeah security. i uh, nothing i'm saying reflects my employers or anything like that um so please don't get mad at me <laughs> yeah if ashlyn is the only person on this podcast episode specifically to not say the words fucking die ted sarandos like please know that ashlyn has good reason to do so but i support i support others saying it (laughs) (laughs) you're like i stand with the specter of ted sarandos haunting Haunting, yeah yeah. podcast feed (laughs) um so let's talk about the writer strike so For those of you who don't know, the Writers Guild of America is split up into two parts, and those parts sometimes act in synchronicity, but mostly diverge in a very few key ways. I am a member of the Writers Guild of America East, which is statistically a Writers Guild that was comprised of writers in New York. And in the very beginning of the Writers Guild of America East, not entirely, but for the most part, it comprised of network TV writers, as well as SNL writers and late night show writers and people who typically worked in a more um, non-episodic late night TV unscripted format, which all include writing, right? People like The Late Show with Stephen Colbert, even SNL, et cetera, et cetera. All of these things have writing, and that forms the Writers Guild of America East. Now, writers exist in another part of this country, obviously all parts, but specifically in Hollywood. And those writers obviously comprise of TV writers, unscripted reality TV writers, movie writers, and basically anything you can think of in Hollywood that requires people reading off of a teleprompter was made by writers from Netflix to the Oscars, to the Emmys, and so on and so forth. So the Writers Guild of America West has gone on strike famously throughout its history, but most recently, back in 2008, amid a 
looming financial recession and a collapse of American life as we knew it at the time. Um, it disrupted TV. It caused a numerous amounts of confounding seasons of at the time uh, legacy TV staples, as well as like emerging darlings. We think of heroes. We think of Battlestar Galactica as famous examples. Lost is another quote unquote casualty of the 2008 writer's strike. And people for a long time have said many, many things about the 2008 writer's strike, whether it was words of support that, you know, they deserved it. The studios were underpaying writers, as well as a variety of other complaints that now almost how many years has it been? I think it's 15 years, right? Yeah, yeah it, it years? started fall 2007 and it lasted yep. 100 days into 2008. Wow. Yep. 16 years. And yeah, almost 16 years and or over 16 years. Yes. And um, now those complaints have once again come to a head as the contract has expired in recent weeks. And those complaints are numerous. And I would say as just a casual historian of the original writer strike that, you know, we're thinking of the 2008. It wasn't the original, but the one people think of when they say writer strike in modern memory. Um, as just like a casual observer and like semi-historian of it, you know, all those complaints I think have only been exacerbated and made worse and more numerous in ways people couldn't see in 2007, right? When that contract expired, Netflix was not the go-to TV channel for most Americans. AI did not exist. The internet was not a place that we only watch TV on now. Um, the idea of second screen entertainment, aka TV you watch off to the side while you're on something else, <laughs> was not really something people were thinking of or, you know, programmers were building around. And those problems that are born out of technology and also the many, many ways capitalism has begun to completely destroy itself for maybe the final time, God willing, um, have just become so nuts. Like as a casual observer, not as a writer myself in the West side of things, right? I've had my own strikes in the Eastern side of the American seaboard. Um, I've seen other sides of this, but Ashlyn, being so close to it, you have really behind the scenes been telling us a lot about what it has felt like as a non-writer working in the industry, very close to writers, in the many months leading up to it, right? Going back to a year, we were having conversations about like the atmosphere and the whisperings in the office. And now being in the midst of it, how has that buildup felt? Did you feel like there is some kind of payoff happening for you emotionally or for other people you know? Do you feel like these executives are just not learning anything like what's the vibe you're getting well yeah i i definitely think uh plenty of executives are incapable of learning anything um just having heard some people but you know um yeah like even last fall i was like oh be prepared for the writer's strike um because it just it just really seemed like it was leaning that way and obviously it was and i do think it's really important this time around obviously the issues are different than 2007, like you were saying in the kind of intro. And um, I guess, yeah, I think the biggest difference I've seen, although, you know, leadership in unions can can be kind of sometimes out of touch with uh, <laughs> its members. But the the main the big three like uh, WGA, DGA and SAG all seem a lot more unified um, yeah. than they really ever have been. And that is <laughs> uh, due mostly, I think, in part to they're all getting completely boned by streaming residuals um, oh, to like an insane degree. And uh, so they all share that problem specifically, but also, you know, the writers have different problems than uh, the Directors Guild. So there are some things that can't be solved by like, the AMPTP striking a deal with just like the director's guild. Um, yeah. And so, yeah. Can you tell us as the casual observer of this podcast, what the AMPTP stands for? Um, yeah. What is that? <laughs> <laughs> Everyone just said. <laughs> or at least what it represents. You it's the Alliance, the, exact, uh, the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers. So they yes. represent all of the like studios and networks. Yeah. yeah. They are the uh, axis of 
pure chaos and destruction in the yes. entertainment industry. <laughs> and yeah, they are anti art and pro profit. And like I that's will that's gladly say. so like obviously traditionally it's like you know that when you think of like a movie studio like Paramount or like Fox yeah. and ABC, but that's also like you kind of touched on one of the big things is that like Netflix is now part of part of these dealings and um Apple and Amazon, which is like a completely different ball game because this is just like a small branch of those yeah. tech companies. Right. So yeah, they have Apple, different they don't really Yeah, they yeah. have different priorities. And Matt and I know this working in Silicon Valley for as long as we have now. Like these mega, 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 mega corporations do not speak to artists. They don't oh, deal I, with artists. Absolutely not. They no. don't have any kind of understanding of how art gets made, right? Like when you are looking at things like Apple, and Matt and I have actually frighteningly accurate information about this yes. on our own <laughs> lives as uh, freelancers and contractors for so long. People like Apple don't get close to these things, right? Like art that gets made under Apple or graphics or any kind of content is so far down the chain and contracted and subcontracted through so many people who oftentimes are not Apple employees that for Apple and especially Amazon, which is like one of the largest companies in human history, these are just so abstracted to them, right? Like these problems, if they don't even see how their actions affect their internal employees in their own headquarters or in the warehouses they operate, right? Like how do you expect something like Apple or Amazon to pay close attention to what's happening on a studio production of a minor subsidiary company, you know? Well, it's like yeah. the, think of the general studio industry itself or like a movie studio. It starts with executives, goes down to producers and the people who run the show, budgets, and then you have talent. Imagine Imagine all of that then sitting under like one of 17 other departments of like services yeah, that, that Apple and Amazon forms a function. larger conglomerate. Yeah, yeah. yeah, they go even higher. And then I know for ex for specifically Apple and Amazon, it's been compared a lot. I'm pretty sure we've talked about this in previous episodes that for them, the content they produce is in a form really just general marketing for the brand. Like yes. if you produce good content on Amazon or Apple, it's more likely you'll buy Apple products and Amazon products. So yeah. their needs are not are absolutely not about art. <laughs> That's just, you know, a method to get customers. It's not about talent. And something I've I've noticed more recently from writers who have worked on these shows. I'm not going to name names because again, I'm not trying to blow up anyone's spot, but something like a buzz that I've been seeing is that like a lot of these streamers have also been in more recent years and one of the things that has become one of the pillars of the WGA's arguing behind the scenes is that like money so much more money is being spent on these projects, but that money is going to fewer and fewer people. And alongside that, their biggest projects are flopping because so much creative control has been taken away from screenwriters and showrunners and producers and directors and back into the hands of these corporations that aren't really interested in making art. And so as this industry just generally contracts around the strike, they're also fearing that companies like Amazon and Apple are just going to be even more unwilling to fight people over something that isn't even making them the kind of money they might have delusionally thought it was going to make them. So um, that's really interesting, Ashlyn. And I want to ask also if you can tell us anything about this. Like, you don't have to name names and you don't have to say any kind of specifics on jobs, but people who employ writers and people who contract writers, how have you kind of gauged the vibe amongst those people, right? The people you see on Twitter saying like, hey, writers, you should be understanding of all the people who lost their jobs, like the producers and the showrunners and whatnot. Like, what is kind of the vibe amongst those set of people? Yeah, it seems like there's definitely a tension that... Um, I mean, I think there are always going to be like some people that that yeah are gonna pipe up and be like oh like the the wga like the writers are being like selfish or or greedy um but i mean i that it just all the other unions should be doing the same thing and that's like i mean that's what's going on with like sag and yeah. the dga it's not like I ought to see also like those members. Um, they came really close to striking um, just a couple of years ago. Um, yeah. But then they, yeah, they ended up not. And I think that radicalized a bunch of people and it definitely upset 
a lot of people that that were like we are having issues and we do want to change it for our yeah. union as well um i would say i would say this time around there is like a lot of solidarity and i mean yes even even in the weeks like leading up to the strike um productions were kind of slowing down and like on the studio side it was like they were they were a little cagey to like staff people or like hire directors or anything because they're like we don't know if the strike is coming so we're gonna have to shut down anyway you know um so that does like that does slow down every part of this whole city basically um yeah everything everything from like you know camera rentals and like permits and stuff like everything is everything is slowing down so it affects um the whole town but that's also kind of the point <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> of the I was gonna say, like everyone being on thin ice about it is like exactly what we want like people it's are like shocked yeah people are shocked that like it has consequences and are like no like it's disrupting our jobs and it's like Yes. Yes. <laughs> we always yes. have to do this with any strike, whether it's like a Starbucks employee, an Apple employee, or writers or directors. Like the whole point of a strike is to disrupt and cause trouble. Yeah. And to cause damage. And it's yeah. not, yeah, it's not to like hurt other people in the industry. And that's not, that's well, not what the strike, obviously what the strike is about. And, and the, it's, yeah. I was going to say, we've already seen that like the stock values of like Paramount and NBC and some other, these big conglomerates already dropped enough to the value of which the writers are demanding as a collective bargaining tactic. So it's like, you can already see that if they just, you know, made the deal, agreed with them, worked with them ahead of time, they would be saving money and nobody would have to go through this. Yeah. And in my question, I really hope this is clear. Like I'm trying to get at that point that this time around the unions around the WGA are united in a, in a really unprecedented way, because like traditionally speaking, the WGA, the DGA, and the PGA don't usually see eye to eye on everything, right? Because you have all these people in Hollywood that are fighting for a limited amount of money. And historically speaking, people like directors and producers have, according to a lot of writers I know, just their own opinion, not necessarily mine, been overpaid, although I would say producers are way overpaid. And I think anyone will (laughs) agree with that. It's interesting that even those people that historically have been called overpaid or, you know, they get the main cut of all the money, historically speaking, even those people are now seeing the effects of the Netflixization of the entertainment industry where, you know, it's a tech business that got into entertainment. It wasn't an entertainment corporation that went multinational or conglomerated or, you know, acquiesced to a bunch of different companies that were all merging together, right? Like Netflix was a tech company and it's always been a tech company and we're really seeing the effects of that. So the strike went into effect May 2nd in a statement with The WGAW, the leading committee for the WGAW, said, following a unanimous recommendation of the WGA Negotiating Committee, the Board of Directors of the Writers Guild of America West, and the Council of Writers of Guild of America East, acting upon authority granted to them by their memberships, have voted unanimously to call a strike, effective 12.01 a.m. Tuesday, May 2nd. It was made following six weeks of negotiations with Netflix, Amazon, Apple, Disney, Warner, Discovery, NBC, Universal. Paramount and Sony under the umbrella of the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers, AMPTP. The negotiating committee began this process intent on making a fair deal, but the studio's responses have been wholly insufficient in given the existential crisis writers are facing. Now, I want to say just off the top, from the last strike, if we want to talk about how unprecedented this strike is, of that last strike, Netflix... Amazon, Apple, Discovery Warner, and Paramount are new to the bargaining table in the sense that these corporate these were mergers and they were rebrands and they were studios downsizing, being bought off, sold, et cetera, et cetera. Paramount as like Paramount itself is like a more recent endeavor of many, many different corporations that rebranded under Paramount, which was an existing namesake um but specifically apple disney sorry not disney amazon and netflix are really the big ones people are gunning for and it is i think says a lot that so many new companies are here this time around right and in the end that, it's also all streaming like disney is now disney plus really if yes. i'm being honest <laughs> yeah 
So the list of demands got posted at WGAContract2023.org. Um, this is called the pattern of demands. So it really is just kind of the general outline of these demands that they are bringing studios. We know a lot about this, obviously, because it's part of a striking tactic to publish your list of demands, right? Drive publicity, get people talking about what these demands are. And I've had to write these lists of demands before for the WGAE when I was in the um, GMG union. So of these demands, they cover compensation and residuals, pension plans and health funds, professional standards and protections in the employment of writers. So in these, we have increased minimum compensation significantly to address the devaluation of writing in all areas of television, new media, and features, standardized compensation in residual terms for features, whether released theatrically or on streaming, address the abuse of mini rooms, ensure appropriate TV writing compensation throughout entire process of pre-production, production, production, post-production, expand these protections, apply MBA minimums to comedy variety programs, increase residuals, and restrict uncompensated use of excerpts. Now, there's a lot of industry buzzwords and industry terms in this. One of the ones I want to ask about first, Ashlyn, is mini rooms. So can you give us kind of any idea about what a mini room is and how it operates and maybe how it's a little bit newer of a practice for these streaming giants yeah so i mean i guess it's it's basically like you know a sort of workaround to hiring like an actual full writer's room and a lot of times this will be even before um a tv show is like greenlit um it kind of acts as a way for um the studio to get like a kind of like overview just like a rough sketch of like the whole season and they'll hire you know mainly upper level writers um it'll be a a much smaller room maybe just like a handful of people like you know four people five people um like breaking a whole season of a show and there's they they work for like you know the absolute minimum which like the whole point of like you know you have an agent or whatever and you're an upper level writer is your negotiation you're negotiating for over the minimum because you supposedly have the experience yeah. um you're like I'm, I'm just using this as an example you're like lauren michaels right and you're like i'm yeah. lauren michaels i have an agent <laughs> right yeah writing lauren for michaels. the base standard yeah. yeah yeah or you're like you know like i'm shonda rhymes like yeah, I'm not. I'm not, like I'm not worrying not for the minimum for the uh, union minimum. Yeah, way, these minimums are they? I, I I've seen this before, so I'm a little confused. Not maybe you can clarify, but these are are these yearly, monthly salaries, hourly per these project are, basis? These are these happen? are like weekly or episodically okay. generally. Yeah, um, yeah, so you know, like if you're if you're lucky, you know, you're writing. On, you'll. I mean, pretty much no writer is writing like 50 weeks out of the year you know unless you're like really like high up like maybe you're like the showrunner so you're involved with like the whole process you are working but that is also you know a thing to address with like span protections and making sure that people are getting paid through the post-production process um yeah because just because writers write scripts doesn't mean that it's done when they're when they write the script like and that's yeah that's one of the the points of like the strike or uh according to like the wga's rules um you can't you can't edit a locked script so there are yep. productions that are still trying to film a lot are getting shut down um but you end up with not as good of a product because you don't have the ability to have the writers there to you know like maybe a line isn't working or they've come up with something like a little bit better like then they can edit the script and like work with it as as it's yeah, being filmed and, and then they can't at all right like you're not no even, you can't you can't do that too <laughs> yeah yeah and this has gone away a lot i mean it used to be historically speaking with big network tv syndicated sitcoms you know that not syndicated sitcoms just sitcoms you know on big network tv shows you would have at least the head writer there right and mm-hmm. or teams of writers that would be on set especially for sitcoms because With sitcoms, you're doing it in front of a live studio audience. And so sometimes it's not going to work in the first take. And so you have a writer there to be like, wait, let's try the line like this, right? That's considered writing. And one of the things that they're fighting against is shows like Netflix have so much 
pre-writing that gets done as well as post-writing that gets done. And that writing isn't always compensated, correct, Ashley? That's one yeah, of the Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and that, like, they one of the things yeah is like a minimum staff guarantee which you see like a lot of really stupid people being like yeah oh how can you how can you put a number on like what it takes to to make art or whatever but like not understanding how the production of a show actually goes um and you know yeah like you can have like one person technically or like four people write a show but they're they're squeezing the writers first of all like trying to hire less and less writers to do so much work like it takes a lot of work to write a whole season uh you know in a couple in a couple weeks um and then also having you know just a couple people in the writer's room makes it basically impossible for lower level writers to get staffed on the show because they're going to prioritize more experience upper level writers um it it doesn't give you the chance to be in the room and kind of learn how to write tv and then uh like you were saying a little bit is that they're also not allowing writers to come to the set um they would have to you know like pay for them (laughs) uh so like they they pretty much have like whittled it down to like the showrunner being involved in the production and post-production process but that is like a vital part to learning how to be a writer and like seeing how your words are filmed like yeah let's part it's part yeah it makes you a better writer and then you can kind of understand like what works and what doesn't work like oh i wrote something really complicated or something really expensive um it's just like you don't get to see it up close and that you're not gonna have like a a pool of talented writers um, in the future. Yeah. And something I really want to double down on here, because it's really interesting that you bring it up and it goes back so much to TV shows Matt and I casually talk about here on the podcast. You hear us a lot rag on these Netflix shows and like these Amazon shows and you watch them and Matt and I will joke like that Netflix show, like it's almost like a non show. It's like an anti show where you're watching (laughs) it and it doesn't feel like TV. It doesn't feel like it like goes through the motions and has like signifiers of content, but you truly can't like revel in it or enjoy it. There (laughs) is bad writing in the world, right? And Netflix in its quest to pay people as cheaply as possible has certainly probably scrubbed around some bad writers, but we're not going to blame this on writers. We're going to blame this on studios doing exactly what Ashlyn is saying, which is staffing shows with less and less people. I mean, Netflix shows more than ever, and this is a well-publicized fact, are made so quickly. Unless you are talking about these huge productions like Stranger Things with all these actors and cast members, even then they are made faster than traditional TV because Netflix wants to pump out as much content as possible in two seasons and then cancel it so they don't have to give anyone a raise. And when you have four people writing a show, like Ashlyn said, in a matter of weeks or even two people or sometimes one person, you're not getting the richness that you see in the golden heyday of shows like The Sopranos or Desperate Housewives, or even things like Ugly Betty, where there were hordes of writers that were touching that show and tuning up dialogue for actors and for characters that might not be, quote unquote, important characters, right? But their two lines of dialogue had a lot of care put into them because the product itself benefited when every part of the show worked and had a lot of eyes on it you're also yeah getting like less episodes per season so like the standard is like you know eight to ten yeah a lot of times not even 13 when a lot of network you know sitcoms and stuff you get like 22 episodes and you get time for the characters to develop you get time for episodes that aren't you know just progressing the plot necessarily but like kind of building the world but now, yeah, all of these places don't want to give time for these shows to develop. They don't want to actually put in any work in development. They want a hit off the bat or they're canceling it. And you can see, and, I was going to say, you can see the effect of just like reducing staff in all aspects, not even just the writers. Like one thing, Ashley, I know you and I and a lot of people on the Discord talk about all the time is with CGI being so commonplace now, makeup and hair and lighting just falls to the wayside because shooting neutral makes post a lot more flexible. And thereby, yes. You don't have to hire as many wig stylists. You don't have to have as many creative directors or people working on set. And then 
combine that with shorter episodes, smaller writer's room, and then that other trick they do now where they do only a few actors per episode and shift the focus every few episodes so they get paid less per episode as well. So it's just like you're noticing that they don't have to pay them a consistent rate per episode. Yeah, exactly. So you just see every aspect of the production process being just erased to the bottom. Yeah. And one thing that I want to double down on here as we move on is the pension plan and health fund. So increased contributions to pension plan and health fund. One thing that has been a really interesting point that has gone completely by the wayside on Twitter when you hear about these things that Ashlyn's talking about, the staff minimums, which are a big deal in the contract negotiations right now. If you think about it, and through the numbers the WGA has published, there are statistically speaking, less jobs for writers now and more TV than ever before. And that paradox is, in the end, going to be the death of the Writers Guild of America if something is not done about it. Because what happens is the Writers Guild of America, those protections are also put in place so that there is a minimum amount of people contributing to pension plans and health funds that make things like unions worthwhile and strong and powerful bargaining forces, as well as a cohesive unit. Because as you have less and less people coming into the union, as well as working and then contributing back, and you have this large unemployed base who is at times taking from the healthcare plans and taking from those pensions, you are crippling those union plans and pensions and healthcare funds because there is less money going into them as the salaries go down, as the opportunities for jobs decrease. And so one of the kind of skeletons in this bargaining tactic is ensuring that writers going forward can continue to take from their health savings plans and contribute and take from pensions when they retire and things like that. Because those kinds of things are at risk if these contributions continue being so low, thanks to the actions of places like Netflix and Apple, who want people working less and for less, working more, excuse me, less people doing it and for way less than they were usually used to. So the negotiations, um, we have a quick little PowerPoint from the WGA Mm -hmm. on these negotiations. We're not going to go step by step for all of it because there's a lot of different tactics, but there is a few that I think are really big. So the WGA proposals, including this, and then they give the offers by the AMPT. So AMPTP. Is, yeah, AMPTP. Um, I feel like I'm it's the worst. Word. It's the right. worst. It's a pretty rough one. <laughs> it's so. so hard to say. Like, it's needlessly long. It's so annoying. <laughs> so for one of these, episodic TV. So this is for preserving the writer's room. So for pre-greenlight rooms, the WGA proposed a minimum staff of six writers, including four writer producers. Post-greenlight rooms mean things that have happened after the TV gets greenlit by the studio and it gets ordered to series, one writer per episode up to six episodes, then one additional writer required for each two episodes after six up to a max of 12 writers. So this would mean that for the things like ABC that usually will order, say, like 24 episodes of Grey's Anatomy, you are going to get a maximum of up to 12 writers for something like that. But if it was a 12-episode order, then you're going to start with one writer up to the sixth. And then by the eighth episode, you're going to have two. By the 10th episode, you need to have three, excuse me. And by the final episode, the 12th episode, you need four, is what I'm understanding out of that. Correct, Ashlyn? I mean, yeah, like they give an example, like eight episodes requires seven writers, including four writer producers. Ten episodes would require eight writers, including five writer producers. Yes. Uh, Okay, okay. great. So the AMPTP rejected our proposals and refused to make a counter, basically stating that they do not want to negotiate on this and that they intend to do away with the writer's room entirely and or are going to ask the WGA to just accept whatever it is proposed in the end if they think they can wear the strike down, right? Yeah, it becomes part of these... A fun little, just a fun little uh, pattern in this whole thing of them rejecting the proposals and refusing to make a counter. Yes. And for these pre-greenlight rooms, minimum staffs, one of the proposals was the minimum staff guaranteed at least 10 consecutive weeks of work, meaning they have 10 weeks to write this show and actually work and contribute and collect pay for. And after it has been greenlit, 
the writers on staff must get at least three weeks per episode. Half the minimum staff must be employed through production and one writer must be employed through post. And they uh, rejected their entire proposal and refused to make a counter. And like Ashlyn said, this keeps going throughout. And as a union bargainer in my past lives and currently in many ways still, one thing that you see with these executives is part of the reason they refuse to make a counter is it is a scare tactic and also a bargaining tactic, right? Because if they give you a bar to shoot for and negotiate them down from, you're going to have an increased fire under you to keep striking, right? Because you know what their bar is. You know what it is that they're going to cap you on. So you can say, guys, we just have to get them down from this. But by refusing to make counters, what they're saying is, strike. We'll wait you out, right? We have our content vaults. We have all these things that we've never released that we greenlit and then canceled before they ever aired. And we have enough TV to wait you guys out. So go on your strike and come back to us when you want your jobs back, right? And they think that that's going to wear the writers down. And ultimately, I really think that it is not going to work, right? Because these writers are, as Ashlyn said, more unified than ever. So we're going to keep going here. So There's this New Yorker piece that I want to read a few excerpts from, and I'd love your commentary on, Ashlyn, because this was a harrowing read. This came out in the eve of the strike, April 29th, 2023. It's from the New Yorker. Why are writers so miserable? And I want to read these two paragraphs back to back, and then we can kind of talk about it. One point of contention in the WGA negotiations has been mini-rooms, condensed writer's rooms that often take place before a show is green-lighted. Mini-rooms give studios proof of concept while saving money, but they force writers to spread paltrier fees over longer gaps, working for shows that may or may not get made. What you start to realize is there is no advancing forward because you're constantly in these rooms where you're being paid at minimum, writer Janine Neighbors told me. If your contract ends and that show's not going to be made for another year— All of your work could just be erased. Ali Monroe, a 30-year-old writer who's worked for production assistant to story editor on Hulu's The Handmaid's Tale, told me that she makes about $10,000 a year in residuals, and that's certainly not reflective of what the studio is making. In the long breaks between seasons, she relies on her wife's more regular income while stretching out the money from Handmaid. Some of her friends are getting copywriting jobs or moving back in with their parents, quote, Before the strike demands came out, a lot of my friends were feeling really hopeless and essentially ready to give up because it had just been such a hard road. And they think that the WGA is asking for us, makes us all feel really good and like we're working towards something that can make it back into a livable career for all of us. That's certainly how I feel. Now, on this point, Ashlyn, something that you see on Twitter a lot is these non-writers non-industry people looking at this and saying, you know, this is a bourgeois concern, right? These are middle-class people that are asking for enough money that they already have, right? Like they get their residuals from The Handmaid's Tale. Why do they want more money? But you look at it and $10,000 in residuals a year, say you don't get any projects that year, that's $10,000 a year that you've made, right? That's right. below the poverty line in America, right? Especially it's, in LA. I was say, especially, especially in California. In LA. Hello. So, Um, Just amongst writers you know, but also these dwindling residuals checks, um, how long have people been noticing this residual decrease? Is this something that comes up? Like, is this something that people talk about amongst themselves, like that they've just universally seen their residuals go down? Oh, yeah. I mean, I've, I've seen that for like years leading up to this. And like, especially even with, um, I feel like the first time I actually was hearing about that was from the actors um oh. especially for oh, like netflix shows because um yeah like they would they would maybe pay like a little bit more up front so like that is very appealing you know because you're like oh i'm getting paid more but then you know especially ne- like netflix especially is very secretive about all of their data which would um you know, lend itself to residual income. So, you know, if you know the numbers, you would know what actors and writers and everyone else should be paid in residuals. Um, And it just seems like it kind of goes into like a black box and then they're like, here you go, here's your $2 uh, residual. And it's like, that's not really adding up and that's not really what I would get paid on like a network show traditionally. Um, So... Yeah, definitely. That's been a point of contention for a while. Um, 
Yeah. yeah. And it's an interesting paradox that Netflix forces people to believe. They don't give us a choice, right? Like this is the reality Netflix presents and they say, you have to accept it. You yeah. Know, something will be quote unquote, the number one show on Netflix or quote unquote, the most watched show ever on Netflix. And the residuals for that for the writers will be like Ashlyn said, $2, right? So by that logic, if it's the number one show and we're going by network standards and that residual is $2, then that's like the worst performing show on ABC, right? Like (laughs) inherently it's a bad product, but that's not true because we know people like Ted Sarandos are making tens of millions of dollars a year, yeah, right? And like, like somebody's making that money. And you think of even just the amount of writers working for Netflix, like you could quite literally split up 49 of that 50 million quite substantially between them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean like there's, right there. there's like a couple points in that, like, you know, one thing you'll see, um, I don't have the chart in front of me, but like compared from writers working, um, I can't remember if it was like 2007, 2008, or if it was like, you know, 2001, 2002, but compared to now, Um, when you see, you know, going up the scale from like staff writer at the very bottom to showrunner at the very top and all of the steps in between, um, the, the minimum, like the, the amount of writers making the minimum has increased a lot, like across the board. So even, I mean, it's certainly less, I mean, when you look at staff writers, it's like, you know, like 88% of them getting paid the minimum now. Um, but when you go up to like, you know, upper level writers, even that, even they have had like an increase of like, you know, like, then it's like a quarter of them, which the whole point of, you know, like I said earlier, having that experience, having an agent is for them to, for you, you know, as a writer to be like, I'm, I'm worth a little bit more than the minimum, you know, I've written on all these shows, I have this experience, I've been in rooms and stuff and them just kind of trying to like you know squeeze writers for as much as they can and being like well do you want the job or not like we're we're gonna offer you like the legal minimum that we have to pay you as a writer just based on your title but yeah yeah i mean well i'm sure that legal minimum from 2008 proportional to now with you just for inflation i'm sure is not matching the no no of of course (laughs) and that's like the other thing of course that you know um i mean for me specifically like I, I will end up, you know, dealing with some upper level writers. So, if, you know, not that they're not hurting too, but like they they definitely make like a bit more than someone yeah. who's like newer starting out like a lower level. Um, but like, yeah, they're, they're still, they're still not making that much. <laughs> I'm like lost my train of thought for a second. Um, just, Yeah not making what was i even saying just now yeah no i agree with you and one thing that i think about all the time and actually i think you both have seen this well matt you've definitely seen the show because we reference it constantly but something i think about a lot as like in the indication of how much the industry has changed in such a short amount of time um fans of the show will know matt and i one of our favorite tv shows ever is the comeback oh and i was thinking about that this whole time honestly (laughs) there is famously a scene in the comeback where our icon valerie cherish is sitting in a cafe with mickey her assistant and they are calling in to the line that tells you what your nielsen ratings were the night before right in like 0.2, 0.4, that kind of thing, or like a 2.0, that kind of thing. And they're sitting there on the phone, right? And they're desperate. (laughs) They're like so stressed out to know what this number is going to be because it is how back in the day people lived and died by how many people were watching your show. It was the architecture of the entire industry's pay scale of what gets greenlit, what these algorithms that were like the proto algorithm studios were using to know what to greenlight again, you know, the original idea of the blockbuster trend was born out of using these numbers of how many people were watching a thing, knowing how many people in America at 9 p.m. tuned in to Sex and the City or The Sopranos or Desperate Housewives. I keep talking about Desperate Housewives, but it is like such an I mean, mind. you should, like, yeah. It is literally like the er network show in my head of like what I constantly go back to. But anyway, it's like, those are the things that I constantly like remember now. Like, I'm sure there are still those agents that are like, checking the viewerships 
But because so much viewership has become obscured, they have allowed, you know, these studios to really drastically decrease these minimums and nobody knows, right? No one knows the data, like you said. Nobody has the information about how many people watch The Handmaid's Tale, which gets brought up here. And I want to end here by mentioning a quote in this piece from Janine Neighbors, who was one of the co-creators and the showrunner for Swarm, a hugely buzzy show. At the same time that money has tightened, original ideas have become harder to sell. Prestige cable days of Mad Men and Nurse Jackie became the streaming era of The Handmaid's Tale and Stranger Things, which has given way to the algorithm and ip field hellscape of superheroes, mergers, and HBO Max becoming plain old Max. More shows are headlined by movie stars, which come with larger salaries and constricted schedules. Neighbors doubts that Swarm would get green-lighted now, even though it just got through a year ago. Right now, especially with the strike looming, people are afraid of weird stuff, she said. Quote, they want Yellowstone. They want This Is Us. Those shows are great, but not everyone wants to write that show. Lila Boyd- Boyock, who has written for the HBO series The Leftovers and Watchmen. Icon, icon. I mean, I imagine writing say. for The Leftovers and Watchmen. Like, iconic. <laughs> um And has previously been a New Yorker fact checker, lamented, quote, what the streamers want most right now is second screen content, which I mentioned previously, where you can be on your phone while it's on, or you can write an original script everyone loves. And then it's like, quote, oh, we can't make this, but please take your tick, take your pick of our upcoming Batman projects, which is like (laughs) so depressing. So before we keep talking, I want to hit a timeline of the strike just up until the point of recording this on Wednesday, May 17th. So on May 5th, THR said studios demand showrunners to work during writer strike. And Matt, you took a little bit of notes on this. What happened here? Yeah. So basically they made a statement saying that they bas- they want to, <laughs> I'll just read the statement here. Honestly, they yeah. said, we want to specifically to reiterate to you as a showrunner or other writer producer that you are not excused from performing your duties as a showrunner and or producer on your series as a result of the WJ strike. Your personal services agreement with the studio requires that you perform your showrunner and or producing duties, even if the WGA attempts to fine you for performing such services during the strike. Um, this was Bob um, McPhail, the assistant chief counsel for the Disney owned ABC signature in the letter he sent to showrunners. Um, obtained by the THR. He also said your duties as a showrunner and or producer are not excused, suspended, or terminated until and unless you are so notified in writing by the studio. And Ashton, can you give us a little bit of information or kind of what you saw on your end of uh, just like in the news and whatnot? Yeah, like who of can these... work and who's not working. It's yeah, a weird who, how these right students how these studios are trying to get these showrunners to write or these producers to do writing. Well, yeah, because the way that um like titles like you you move up in, as like a writer um you you become like a producer i mean you're not you're not like a producer like in the producer's guild but it's like you know you're an executive producer a co-producer um and they're trying to argue that they can be doing the producing aspect of television without somehow doing any writing writing, services which like is like maybe on paper like sounds like it could be possible but is largely impossible to do so they're kind of just trying to make it so it's like okay well just call it producing like saying you're doing the producing side extremely sus and like really just yeah and like show showrunners are writers um and that's like you know there's just, like, a lot of uninformed people, of course, on the internet. So, like, there are people getting mad at, like, Quinta Brunson and trying to be like, you gotta pay your right, like, you know, like, help the writers. And it's like, she is the writers. Like, she is not... She is one of the writers. She's not on the studio side. Um, She is also a writer. She's just, like, at, at the top of the show, basically. Yeah. So, the... uh. On May 5th, also, the AV Club reported that MTV Movie and TV Awards switched to a pre tape show, which was funny because originally they moved to a digital show because they wanted to basically just do a clip show because... Like I said originally, Mm. award shows include writers, right? We know a lot of people, just between Matt and I, who have been writers for award shows. 
And it is a writer's room, even for the Oscars. And, you know, they hire writers to write all the bits and write the flow of the show and all the like padding around the different awards. And the MTV Movie and TV Awards, which you might not even think includes writing, does include writing. And they were going to try and work around this with, you know, a live Zoom call, basically. (laughs) And then they switched to a pre-tape show that was just clip packages from the various things with text. I didn't end up watching it, so I don't know how it turned out for them, but I can't imagine very well. No one talked about it. So Biden called for a fair deal amid for the striking writers on May 8th, just months, what, after striking down the railroad strike? (laughs) Yeah. Hey, thanks, man. Yeah, I'm sure. Thank you. Thank you for this, sir. Yeah, the Game of Thrones prequel was paused. Uh, as Hollywood writers strike continue, this was in the writer. This was coming from the writers' room for a Night of the Seven Kingdoms, the Hedge Knight, which was a Max show that was coming up. Like, good. It, okay, you know, like, just don't actually get the writers paid, but annoying. maybe you never should see the light. Yeah, May tenth, the Writers Guild of America blasts Boston University for picking up Warner Bros. Discovery David Zaslav as the commencement speaker, which is which like absolute most. prison jail for David Zaslav, <laughs> surface of the sun for David Zaslav. Like, my like, God, like prison is invented. Like, I, I, like prison should only be invented for David Zaslav. Like, yes, said, like. Like, the worst person alive. <laughs> Ted Sarandos, um, also prison for Ted Sarandos, on May 10th, decided to skip the Pen America Gala, honoring him amid the WGA strike, given, quote, threat to disrupt event. Oh, oh, <laughs> I love that he's like, I am literally, what's that mean? We are under fucking attack. Like, that's Ted Sarandos being driven around in his helicopter, his bulletproof, missile-proof helicopter above Los Angeles. Like, I just imagine Ted Sarandos in, like, the Pope car being driven down Hollywood Boulevard because he's so afraid of attack right now. Like, he said in his statement, given the threat to disrupt this wonderful evening, I thought it best to pull out so as not to distract from the important work that PEN America does for writers and journalists, as well as a celebration of my friend and personal hero, Lauren Michaels. Mm, um, I also want to I also want to just say in that as well, um, he uh, did also mention that one of the people who is going to be emceeing the event is Colin Jost, which is just Oh my god. (laughs) Woof. So on May 11th, the film and TV shoots at LA hotels may be disrupted as hospitality workers back writers strike. This was an exclusive in the THR. This was Unite Here Local 11, which comprises 30K members across the hospitality union, uh, advocated for their support of the writers strike. And this is coming, I think, last year or the year prior the LA yeah. hospitality unions mm-hmm. also, I believe they went on strike, correct? Or uh, I they believe were organizing. So. Yeah, and they did they were, get there was support a strike that from was in there. The were strikes yeah. over a lot of parts of the US too, even in San Francisco here. There were a lot of yes. um, hospitality workers striking. Um, so then that same day, Netflix, The Verge reported, canceled its in-person upfronts, probably to avoid the WGA's picket lines. The upfronts, as Matt and I talk about constantly when it comes to like Bravo or NBC Universal, are where They will trot out their lineup to advertisers and distributors and broadcasters to be like, look at what we have, right? Like, here's the investor showcase, basically. May 12th, the writer's strike blew up the upfronts again. Basically, this kind of disseminated across all the upfronts. You know, it wasn't just Netflix's. Uh, the notable presenters and comedians who plan to attend these upfronts have pulled out, including Jimmy Kimmel, Jimmy Fallon, Seth Meyers, and Stephen Colbert, who commonly host these sorts of things as different late night hosts. Seth MacFarlane and showrunners exit Family Guy and American Dad until striking WGA gets a new contract. And that's another thing, right? Animation shows also have yeah. writers. They're also in the WGA. Well, yeah, and it's like they're, they're in the WGA. There's also um, the Animation Guild, which yes. um, is a different thing. So there are like, you know, some shows that are tag. Um, so like technically those writers can still work. It's like, so, but like tag is also getting screwed and they're like watching what the WGA is doing because they're like, you don't want to be, you don't want what's happening to us to happen to you. Exactly. Um, My yeah. Sister, solidarity. Do we know, has tag, uh, issued any kind of support for the WGA? Um, I don't know about like an official, uh, like letter or anything, but like I've, I've just 
seen a lot of writers oh. because there's like a lot of overlap. Yeah. Like, so I yeah. see local eight thirty nine did issue a statement of support yeah. on May second. I'm looking. That's the Animation Guild. Is I see local eight thirty nine. Um, they said most animation writing work in LA County is performed under the Animation Guild, IOTC, Local 839 Agreements. These contracts are separate from WGA contracts. And if you are working under a tag contract, you can continue working. What right. if I'm working on a show with WGA writers? Several productions where animation work is covered under tag collective bargaining agreements are also staffed by WGA writers. You can continue performing your work duties as requested, but do not perform any WGA covered work. Remember, struck work can include small requests like, quote, can you punch up this joke? If you are approached by a to-do WGA work, please contact the tag business representatives. Also be prepared that you may face a picket line at your studio and be asked to honor it. So. So, yeah. Um, Matt, you took these notes on this deadline piece that I'm super interested in. I didn't get a chance to read this yet, but this is from Deadline. Why don't you tell us what's going on here? Yeah, so this is about unscripted TV and how basically a lot of the people in those industries are actually pretty scared about what's going to happen. I mean, the headline, I'm just going to read the headline real quick, it's kind of dumb, but they said it's basically not going to be a carefree on girl reality summer because basically in 2007, 2008, there was a lot of creditation to the ramp up of unscripted reality TV coming about because yes. of the writer's strike. You can just basically imagine producers are really all they need to get a lot of shows off, of the, um, off and going. Um, and just to give a little background on that mm-hmm. before we jump in, Ashlyn might also know a little bit about this, but on shows like RuPaul's Drag Race, what has happened is there is writing that goes on on RuPaul's Drag Race. RuPaul's lines, Michelle's lines, the judges' lines, the commentary, the tracks that they play at the beginning and end is all writing. Also, all the rusicals and the TV shows and all the little bits they do, that's all being written. But what happened was they claimed that it wasn't being written, you know, because it was producers doing this or story producers, quote unquote. And it was a (laughs) workaround that they made that got popular during 07, 08 to kind of be a workaround to getting writing made, but also in a way that wasn't covered by the WGA. And because these people have never officially been employed as writers, they're story producers, um, they have been left out of WGA bargaining agreements, even though like one of the big dark secrets of the reality TV industry is it is like one of the larger workforces of ungilded writers that yeah. work in Hollywood right now. Okay. Keep going. Yeah. Now. So of course, because of the strike that's happening right now, um, unfortunately it's not going to have the same, you know, quote unquote positive impact that people reference for the 2008 writer's strike. Um, because of these confluence of event, many of the top non-scripted shows are actually written or have writers producing for them. So some popular game shows are already WGA productions. For example, Jeopardy right now, which we already saw um, my unbelief that she is um, stepping out of the show because it does have WGA writers working for them. Um, of course, Ken Jennings as But Ken Jennings. Um, offering to work across the yeah. picket line, which fits to a lot of his reputation already. But Yeah, Ken Jennings has <laughs> rancid vibes. Yeah, like, not shocking. Um, but apparently, they're already hearing efforts from some writers on other unscripted shows to unionize behind the teams. Um, specifically, even one long-running cable hit is apparently already in talks to become the, within the G, uh, WGA, becoming union members. Um, obviously, a false schedule impacted by a strike could mean additional episodes or extensions of other favorite unscripted shows shows cbs for instance has um basically made a lot of extra content for the amazing race and survivor um there's allegedly also with cbs they're considering adding another big brother to its schedule there's talks of another celebrity all-stars version um another which of course is they're already a long-running reality series because they're on top of season 25 which is set to air later this summer nbc is also planning for more unscripted extensions um deadline apparently understands that it's planning for another installment of america's next gone talent um on its schedule to in addition to season 18 that's airing this year um the voice apparently is also filming two seasons back to back right now season 24 is coming in the fall likely around september but they've already started filming parts of season 25 um however the dga and the sag uh aftra uh could conceivably both strike when their contracts with the amptp expire at the end of june so apparently directors uh walking out would have a Basically, major knock on number of broadcast shows, particularly the studios such as Dancing with the Stars, which has come back to ABC after a short stint with Disney Plus in the fall. Many of the top non scripted shows now attract major A list talents, some of which are also WGA. 
Um, apparently, they've heard about major competition series that was set to hold its first run in LA this year, but because of the strike is now being delayed due to a prominent number of people on the production being in the writers' union. Um, a quote from a non one of the non-scripted producers is saying. Uh, quote, it's a little unsettling because regardless of even if you're making a non-union show, talent might stand in solidarity with the writers. Um, apparently, there's also a possibility that some of the studios that are already looking to cut costs could use the strike to kill a number of expensive reality projects that otherwise would have needed to air. Another source said, all of my scripted friends are saying this must be great for you, but it's not it's actually quite scary. I wonder, okay, I really am curious, just as an aside, what the long-running cable hit might be that's considering right. unionizing. Because, again, I, I we were just talking about Drag Race, and there's been constant talks about a drag queen union for World of Wonder, like World I of mean, Wonder union. absolutely at this point. But I, I don't think it's Drag Race, but no. I'm just thinking about other cable. It's not The Real Housewives, because... Um, I've just heard like behind the scenes gossip about Bravo, and that's I don't think it's Bravo. Doesn't seem necessary, yeah. I wonder if maybe it's Survivor or Big Brother. I mean, like those shows have a lot of writing, right? Like, there's a lot of like. Well, they did say in this that gets article done. that they are working on maybe another Big Brother season this year, so I think it's not that. Yeah, I wonder what the long running cable hit might be. I'm just like. Now I'm fascinated by it. Like, <laughs> I, like I'm just like thinking like Amer- it's not network, so it's not like American Idol. It's not The Voice. It's not one of those things, right? I wonder. Anyways, we'll have to come back to that. So let's talk a little bit about some of these um, shows that have been up, up uh, sorry, affected by the strike. And there's so many shows on here where I'm like. What the fuck is this show? Who, what, like, <laughs> how is there so much TV and no one's getting paid for it? Right? Like, well, exactly. Right? More content than ever, and yet these people are still suffering. <laughs> so they, here's they, just a list. They have been and... really effective, especially in New York, at shutting down yes. a lot of productions. Um, LA yeah. is hard because those studio lots have so many like different like just it's LA They've, is a much yeah. harder city to shut down stuff in. But in New York on those city blocks, it is very easy to form a picket line around like the mm-hmm. entrance and exit to a studio back lot or not. They're not really back lots in New York, but you know, a garage. So here's some of these things. We have the daytime Emmy awards, the penguin, never seen it. You bet your <laughs> it, life. It's what? not on yet. <laughs> yeah. While you were breeding, while you were breeding. Oh my like, God. I'm sorry. The, the free form series. While I you haven't were even breeding. heard that one. What? It's that. It's, I can't, I can't do that. No. Can someone look that up for me, please? <laughs> okay. We also have Dick Wolf's on call. The chai, uh, the shy, um, FBI most wanted pretty little liars. Summer school. On HBO Max, <laughs> good Power Book Two, Ghost, P Valley. Oh, that makes me sad. Um, well, not sad because it's not gonna like it. Just that's like a show that I hope doesn't go away. I okay, really like while you're breeding, I don't think it's premiered yet. Um, okay, follows Casey, single for the first time in her 30s, as she escapes her fast-paced life in Los Angeles to see the world. From culture clash to vacation oh. romances, this internationally set dramedy is a globe-trotting journey of self-discovery that will inspire the wanderlust inside everyone. But why is it called it's that? Called breeding, <laughs> like, like she. I like, guess oh, I mean fast-paced. Like while you were getting fucked, I was like <laughs> getting. I was seeing the sunrise in Tahiti. Yeah, the, like, the sun's very child free of her um but it's like i guess because she's like single in her 30s so it's like while you're like with your stupid husband uh, and your while stupid y'all are baby down having children oh, yeah i am out okay i hate oh it's like one of those like uh child free shows no way <laughs> so we have billions and then an untitled ava duvernay drama sinking spring good trouble um, I've seen that somewhere, but I don't know what it is. Uh, Severance, which is the Apple TV mm-hmm. show that just also had a, didn't Severance, Matt or Ashlyn, do you mind looking it up uh, about rumors about like bad set on Severance? I believe yes. there was a report yeah, that I came out about it, correct? Recently about that. We have Night of the Seven Kingdoms, The Hedge Knight, which was the George R. R. Martin show. Uh, he says the co-creator, George, put it on, uh, put it on pause, bunked evil, uh, which is paramount. MTV Movie TV Awards, Stranger Things, Loot, 
hacks. Oh, Matt, loot is that weird Maya Rudolph show we were trying that, to figure yeah. out. Yeah, show about. is looks wretched. I won't lie. We have hacks. <laughs> uh, really good show. Uh, Unstable Night Court, Venery of Samantha Bird, Power Book Three, Raising Canaan. Cobra Kai, Yellow Jackets, Abbott Elementary, and that's the running list so far. Oh, I found some um, info we... about that Severance drama, by the way. Yeah, please. So it was actually in late April before the strike went through. It was reported that Severance Season 2 is facing major issues behind the scenes, getting us from Screen Ramp, by the way, um, including a possible falling out between co-creators Dan Erickson and Mark Friedman, along with uh, the script going way over budget. The report also alleged that the House of Cards creator, Bo Will- um, Willimam, uh, has been brought on to smooth things over. Producer Ben Stiller later said the work on Severance Season 2 was not delayed, but was still on track to finish until, obviously, as we see now, through the WGA strike. Um, but yeah, the follow-up between the co-creators is very interesting. Of course, the budgets are, I'm sure, causing issues. Ashlyn, if this is like a... If this is too probing of a question, feel free not to answer it. But um, I want to ask if you've ever heard this. I have heard from various sources close to apple tv plus that the early years of apple tv plus were pretty rough and i think matt and i have talked about this on the podcast before where one thing very clearly a source who will remain unnamed told me was that apple came in and had no idea how to make television i mean that sounds right (laughs) yeah one thing I heard also in that was that a lot of the people that these historically trade unionist jobs um, and or just union jobs like producers or the IATSE people or, you know, the people that run the vans and build the set. Well, yeah, like the Teamsters it. have been like a the huge teamsters. ally. Mm-hmm. They were all saying that these people that they suddenly had to work with for these streamer shows that were tech show tech companies going into streaming like apple and amazon was that these companies didn't have one the connections so Hmm. you know you'd be a producer and you'd get contracted by apple and then all the you know supplies i say quote unquote or you know networks and kind of like production pipelines that traditionally exist don't exist because these you know former marketing manager at apple turned studio executive like (laughs) doesn't know the local iotc rep or like doesn't know who to call to get a set built and so you're doing all that extra work for them and then that work is unpaid right because you're having to basically build these production pipelines for studios that are not accurately compensating you so that's something i've heard gossip around town um and i always thought that was interesting because you never think about that right that like you know paramount has people they've been working with since like almost the <laughs> like like a hundred years i was yeah. gonna say these are like actually like true artisans and like this yeah of apple, the Lovers. local artisans yeah, of like, Hollywood. yeah. <laughs> apple of course poached people from mm-hmm. different companies and different studios but also like if you look a lot of them were like you know former head of user engagement at apple is now like a (laughs) producer in you know the morning show i'm just pulling that out my ass but have you kind of noticed that with the writers at all or like these studios that you've had to interface that like there's just like a total communication breakdown or like things that used to work don't work anymore um I mean, yeah, I I don't know, like, the specifics at Apple or anything like that. Um, I guess I would say just, like, probably the only thing that I could, like, with firsthand experience kind of noticed is just, like, they really don't know what they want. And because, (laughs) you know, like, the executives, a lot of them you know yeah like they were head of user engagement or something like they they aren't like writers they aren't necessarily creatives like you know there are some there are some executives that get into it because you know they want to work in development and like do want to help like see a creative vision but like a lot of them don't know what they're doing necessarily and are just like chasing chasing a number chasing a trend tracing algorithms which like you know for how long it takes to produce a tv show from like con like the idea to it actually being on a tv screen like it's so stupid to be like well this is working so we're gonna we need more scripts like this like this current big show like oh yeah we need something like yellowstone we need something like stranger things when it's like by the time that gets made like 
there's no guarantee that that's going to be trendy, that that's going to be what people want. Like, you know, and then it just because it's similar doesn't mean that it's also going to be a hit. So that's something that I've seen, I guess, where it's just like their mandate for like what they're looking for as a network will change like monthly. (laughs) And it's like, how are you developing anything if you're changing your mind so often? And work in such a short term scale. Exactly. And that's what I think about constantly is just that like, I am looking at these shows now, like Yellow Jackets is a great example. Um, Yellow Jackets has this, uh, you know, premise of being like survival horror, which has, you know, always been a thing. But you look at Yellow Jackets and then you like look at the streamers now and almost every streamer is like pushing for a Yellow Jackets type. Like you just suddenly see like six different Yellow Jackets and it's like, what the fuck is going on? Like these people are literally like not even thinking about it in terms of like algorithmically speaking, what's working in like broad scale. They are literally just like copy and paste this or and do it with four people. And oh my no God. Creative vision for it. Or even worse, like just like trying to make a cinematic universe out of every series oh. or just like oh. make it like a franchise when it's like, I don't think people necessarily are looking for like a billions franchise. They are making like two spinoffs of that show. Yeah. They're it's like especially Showtime. Just like just a lot of like spinoffs yeah, or reboots making, like, of things. Or spinoffs and like weeds and nurse Jackie. They're like they're yes. rebooting they're rebooting, yeah, yeah. Nurse Jackie and Weeds. <laughs> it's like, Can, I, like you weeds literally is a run good out of show, ideas. But why are we rebooting weeds? I think weeds left off in like a pretty yeah. Is it because way, they can like, give Chat GPT the entire script like outline from all those seasons and just pretend? But it's like God. it's it's them being like so terrified of like betting on something or actually having to put in time and development into a show that they're like, well, people already liked billions, so let's just do billions two more times because we have a built-in audience and they'll just they'll just Eat up, eat up the slop like like it's just like oh yeah they liked this so we're just gonna put it in the microwave and serve it to them again it's terrifying so let's get into ted sarandos a little bit um uh this is gonna piss me off so i'm gonna try to like get through this because ted is one of those people that like elicits like one of the worst reactions in me because he's so smarmy and smug and like he kind of is like very much David Zaslav who I'm sure is also saying oh horrible my things uh, about the strike but I want to go back to the thing about Ted Sarandos citing Hollywood writer strike as a reason why he won't accept the Penn Visionary Fund so he talks about obviously he thought it was best to pull out like we mentioned and going back to it a Penn spokesperson A Penn spokesperson said no one this year will be given the Business Visionary Award, which in 2022 was won by Audible founder Don Katz. Like Audible, famously another really good platform for writers, right? (laughs) Um, A Netflix spokesperson said there'd be no comment beyond Sarandos' statement. Michaels, whose show has been off the air since May 2nd, is still planning to attend. Lauren Michaels. And according to Penn, the head writer at SNL, Writers Guild member Colin Jost will be serving as the MC, which is like mm, Malik mm, mm, Colin Jost mm, very interesting I think he's one of those people that can lean on his spouse's income during this during this uh, uh, time yes. this dark I don't think time need to work <laughs> so this is from the Pen America quote Our gala program with honorees including Saturday Night Live's Lauren Michaels and MC Colin Jost will center on the escalating campaign of book bans in this country, which is an interesting pivot to make, right? Like, guys, don't worry, we're not crossing a picket line by hosting this event for writers during the writer's strike hosted by a Writers Guild member. Uh, It's about book bans. It's not about the writer's strike. Uh, Tightening restraints on satire and comedy and support of threatened writers worldwide. We look forward to a moving and inspiring event that will fuel our fervent work on behalf of free speech. Oh, <laughs> rotten vibes. I love, I love the idea that like there is an imminent threat 
to writers that doesn't include honoree Ted Sarandos. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, Ted Sarandos. Let's get back to him really quick. So prior to the strike and amid it, there was a Netflix earnings call, which I'm sure everyone saw the news about because the headline for it was everywhere. Uh, this is from IndieWire, but you could get this basically from anyone. You know, there's also the whole call. I listened to it on Observer, but I didn't I didn't really want to cite Observer. So Ted Sarandos, Netflix is better prepared than most if there's a writer's strike, which is just so... Where where did all of your precious fucking content come from, Teddy boy? I wonder. So, quote, we respect writers and we respect the WGA and we wouldn't be here without them. We don't want to strike. The last time there was a strike, it was devastating to the creators. It was really hard on the industry. It was painful for local economies that support productions. And it was very, very bad for fans. Who and there's will two think of the fans? There are two varies. Who will think of the fans? So if there's a strike and we want to work really hard to make sure we can find a fair and equitable deal so we can avoid one. Wow. Wow, Ted, you worked really hard to avoid the strike by denying every single one of the requests oh, and like, refusing to like, make a counter deal. Like my absolute favorite one was for artificial intelligence, where they, you know, obviously wanted to regulate the use of artificial intelligence on yes. NBA cover projects. Just like it can't be source material, like it can't be a uh, write or rewrite literary material. It can't be used as source material. Right. Nothing. And they, of course, rejected the proposal. But instead of refusing to make a counter, they countered by offering annual meetings to discuss advancements in technology. Oh. oh. <laughs> okay. Thank that, you. Thank you. That, I love it. Makes me sick. This is... Okay. Matt and I have sat in meetings like this not about ai obviously but where like we i would i w- i've done this too in newsrooms where you as a union or just as a job like say like hey this is really bad working conditions and rather than address the working conditions your boss is like what if we had a hour every week where we were mindful and then, that's the, like, like, let's have a mindfulness hour. It's kind of also week. giving when you go to HR. Let's be have like a my, mental health day once a year. Like, it's like when you go to your HR. Like, my boss is retaliating. They're abusing me. They're toxic. They're evil. They're saying all these bad things about me, et cetera, et cetera. And then all that comes out of it is them going like, "Well, you know, every month." Your manager's gonna have a meeting with everybody where we talk about our roses and thorns of the week, and we'll oh my just God. get through it. Like I've been there so many. We've all been there multiple times. Um, one of my favorite things about this, uh, as a personal example from my union bargaining days. So when I was on the bargaining committee at the WGA W WGAE, excuse me, GMG union, which was the once conglomerate union for the Gawker Media Group, and then it became the Geo Media Group uh, under Jim Spanfeller, infamously. And I was there for the end of the Univision era and to the Jim Spanfeller era. And the summer 2020, obviously, um, in the lead up to summer 2020, as well as during summer 2020, one of the things that the union was really adamant about was getting diversity numbers at the company and being like, we want to know how many black people Geo Media employs, right? And how many of them are women, et cetera, et cetera. And it was because we had received numerous reports from members that, you know, women and people of color at the union were being underpaid, right? And or not receiving compensation adequate to their white peers. And this was obviously a problem. So we needed these numbers. These numbers are not always available to us because there are in newsroom media unions members that you work alongside that are not in the union, like in many, like my own, uh, not all of the uh, editors were in the union, right? Because some of them as bosses don't get to be in the union or the people that do copywriting, right? For the website or the marketing people or like certain people that work in the offices aren't in the unions, right? So those numbers we didn't have. So anyways, 
tons of back and forth about this, right? And they don't want to pay for it. And then they want to set up their own weekly diversity committee that like just meets to discuss like how the world is bad and like doesn't actually do a committee on anything and going back and forth for months and months. Finally, they say, we're going to hire an independent contractor that we sourced and scoped and met with prior to talking to you. And they're going to do a diversity and inclusion survey for us. And we were like, cool. And it took a full year almost, it felt like, to get those numbers back from them. And when we got it back from them, famously, and this was a source of great pride, uh, at the union, not pride, sorry. This was just a source of great uh, mirth and merriment at the bargaining committee when we finally saw this. Uh, this company had included white women as diverse employees. Oh my God. <laughs> so like they said like, there was like some number like 80% of the company is diverse. And then you look at that statistic and... White women are the number one. Seventy five percent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, like in the meeting, you know, we asked them, like, why on earth would you include white women as like diverse employees, right? Like white straight women as diverse employees. And they were like, well, isn't this what you wanted? And it's <laughs> like these studios, what they want is to, you know, bargain you down. And then offer solutions that to many people who might not be in bargaining feel like a step forward. Like, oh, they want to meet with us about AI. They want to, like, have a conversation with us. But, like, that's a union busting tactic. Like, having a meeting about meetings is a union busting tactic. Yeah, they were like, like it's we succession will, we hear for you. <laughs> we will present a PowerPoint of how all of these robots will be replacing you. Yeah. Th- thank you. Yes. Thanks. Thank you. So he... um continued on this earning call but if there is a strike we have a large base of upcoming shows and films from around the world so we can probably serve our members better than most we don't really want this to happen but we have to make plans for the worst so we do have a pretty robust slate of releases excuse me to take us into a long time but just to be clear we're at the table and we're going to try and get an equitable solution so there is no strike you're actually famously like not at the table like you're refusing to sit and have a conversation at the table they they called the strike before mid like they didn't it wasn't like oh they bargained like to the end like the they like the writers were like the writers guild was like this isn't ha- like it's not happening and like they announced the strike like before midnight even they were like yeah yeah we're going on strike because that's how far apart they were yeah and Sorry, Matt, you first I was gonna say I'm also completely shook. I don't know how this hasn't come up in my mind at all yet when Um, they say at Netflix, oh, we have lots of like overseas productions, like outside of America, like things outside of America that we can produce. And I'm like, oh, here we fucking go. Like, here we go. We're going to start outsourcing the content. Like, why wouldn't you get content from the world where there's no unions and the labor's even cheaper? There have been international unions and guilds who have issued statements. Like, obviously, they they can't technically, you know, they're not technically on strike, but they have issued statements to their writers like, their members like encouraging them not to take yeah, like WGA solidarity. work like yeah because I mean if you if you take if you ever want to be part of like the WGA and you take these these jobs like you run the chance of being blacklisted forever so exactly yeah and one thing I want to mention because this was something that I literally, it's like, this is why I love the way we do our show, because there's so many things we talk about that come into play like years later. Ashlyn, <laughs> you were still on air with us, I think, when we talked about this. Do you remember there was a Leftovers and or Hot Topics episode where one of the points was about working conditions for people who worked on a lot of the Korean shows for Netflix that they were like being underpaid yeah. and that Netflix wasn't meeting like union standards and or like pay standards because they were outsourcing it to Korea, right? Like right. Yeah. For squid games, like they didn't have to pay people like, you know, a living yeah. wage. 
Um, there was a report that came out in uh, Water Carrier of the Billionaire Class, CNBC. <laughs> Netflix's $2.5 billion investment into Korean content appeals to audiences worldwide. Oh, my God. And this is from Friday, May 12th, publishing that. So yeah. over the next four years, Netflix announced it will invest $2.5 billion dollars into various Korean content spanning from TV series, films, and nonfiction shows. Um, they said that it will double, double the number of nonfiction shows that Netflix is producing from about four in 2022 to eight this year, reflecting Korean audiences' demand for variety shows. These will include various different reality shows like Physical 100, um, and Don Kang, Netflix's vice president of Korean content, said, quote, I think it was really the first nonfiction show to have global viewing, getting people really excited. Um, he says that it is going to also be paired alongside things like Singles Inferno, which I think some of our viewers have said they would like love us to talk about at some point. But again, it's like, oh, yeah, I can only do so much Netflix dating right. shows. So I just think that that's fascinating. Also, that literally amid the writer's strike, Netflix trots out its vice president of Korean content to be like yeah. 2.5 billion dollars. <laughs> I mean just just to be clear like the proposals from the WGA would gain writers approximately 429 million dollars a year. So the writers are asking Insane. for 429 million dollars a year for all like across all of their members. Every and they're single member. Every, every member. Every single member. This yeah, this would cover like, everything. The cost of fixing World Hunger would be like this many billion dollars. Oh, yeah, dollars like, like a billion dollars. And <laughs> this many CEOs made that today. Like, <laughs> Yeah, so they're investing $2.5 billion in Korean entertainment. Insane. And they're asking for like less than half a bill a and year. And what's so yes. upsetting is they can probably tout that investment to the Korean television as part of their like diversity inclusive. <laughs> Oh my yeah. God. And one thing I also think about too is, you know, I read that this is not my original thought, by the way. Like, I have been thinking about it a lot, but I want to be clear that I'm not the first person to say this. Have you guys seen some of the writers floating around on Twitter who are talking about this thing from Netflix saying that Netflix probably was, was obviously, we know, preparing for this for a long time, um, but also that their model was so they could stock up so much extra content to outlast the writer's strike uh, so that they yes. were like, oh, all these different things that we are proposing is so we can create a stockpile that mm -hmm. is going to outlive the writer's strike. It's right? all about like the they IP were, pile. Yeah, like they were systematically devaluing writers so they could produce more to eventually outlast the contract ending, which is like... At one point, so like nuclear evil villain, nasty, nasty, little evil baby man move, but also so believable when you listen to Ted Sarandos talk that like, this oh, yeah. is the way that they are thinking. And the people are like applauding him for like his fantastic yes. business efforts. Oh, look at him. Look at him. He's made Netflix such so much money. So we also have another fun report. So Ashlyn, can you give us that number one more time just so we have it in our heads? Uh, $429 million a year. Yes. And to be clear, right, Netflix obviously doesn't just pay Ted Sarandos. It also pays its board members who make many, many millions, just to keep that in your head when I read this next headline. Netflix's Reed Hastings, Ted Sarandos, see compensations rise to more than $50 million in 2022. For each of them. So we're already at $100 million. So, like $150, or just the two of them? Yeah, 100 yeah. Reed Hastings, who stepped is getting this directly from Variety. I'm going to quote it directly. Reed Hastings, who stepped aside as co CEO of Netflix in January and co chief Ted Sarandos, both saw double digit increases in their compensation packages for 2022, with their total pay topping $50 million each. Hastings' total pay last year was $51 million and 49 million of which was stock option awards up to 25% from 2021 25% pay increase in 2022 okay gets worse the streamer disclosed in its 2023 proxy statement that Sarandos's pay jumped 31% 
in 2022 to 50 million, comprising 20 million base pay, meaning no matter what happens, Ted Sarandos is guaranteed 20, and then 28 million in stock options and an additional 1.79 million in other compensations, including 1.43 million. In residential security costs, I so he has to laugh. He has his like his like house security being paid for like one and a half mil. Literally, That's why that black box has... security that Britney's under, honey. I'm not oh joking. my god, like, that shit's expensive. Like, <laughs> <laughs> okay, it gets worse. So, in stepping down as co CEO, Hastings will take a huge pay cut for 2023 mm-hmm. as executive chairman. He's eligible to receive 500 thousand base salary plus. 2.5 in stock options in the co-CEO role. He stood to make 34.7 million this year base pay, mostly in stock. Greg Peters, former chief product officer and COO, was named co-CEO alongside Sarandos in 2023. Peters will see his compensation package increase from 28.1 million to 34.65 million as co-CEO. $3 million annual salary, $17.3 million in options, and $14 million in performance-based target Shut bonuses. Shut the fuck up. So <laughs> oh, so that's where the numbers re- go. That's where all the yes. viewership money goes. I see, I see. So yeah. Sarandos is set to receive $40 million for a $3 million salary, $20 million in options, and a $17 million performance-based target bonus. It makes bonus. me want to throw um, it. Part of this contraction in Sarandos's salary, you know, God forbid he only makes 40 instead of 50 this year is because Netflix didn't necessarily um, meet its target growth because of, you know, as they say, economic headwinds. Um, (laughs) Netflix said in a statement, quote, we had a bumpy start to 2022, but a brighter finish, adding that it added 9 million paid members over the course of the year to 230 million worldwide. It generated 31.6 billion in revenue, representing 6% year over growth. And the stock price, however, declined dramatically after its subscriber counts declined in the first half of the year and shares closed the year down 51%. So I think that... This is something that is truly shocking to think about, right? It it generated like billions and billions and billions, tens of billions of dollars in revenue. And the writers are asking for all the companies combined, Sony and all the other ones, uh, Netflix, Amazon, Apple, Disney, Paramount, all of it for less than half a million. I mean, sorry, less than half a billion, right? And Netflix alone generated 50 billion in revenue, right? Imagine all the studios combined. Fucking Disney? Yeah. Imagine what Disney made last year in residuals I, for their own shows. It's it's been bothering me because I forgot what I was going to say earlier, but I remembered and like with all of these numbers in mind, you know, like you'll see maybe like a staff writer or like a story editor or something like you'll look it up, you know, you don't work in TV or whatever and you see, wow, these writers are making like 5 to $7,000 a week. And they're complaining they're going on strike or whatever. Yes. But then, you know, these writers aren't working a whole year. If they're lucky, you know, you're working like 24 weeks or something, 20 weeks, which still looks nice on paper. You know, you're making like $100,000 a year or like, you know, $70,000 for like a couple months work. So people don't understand what, what they're crying about. But that's, you know... You're paying your agent 10%. You might be paying yes. a manager 10 Let's to 15%. To you're paying an attorney 5%. You're paying, uh, you know, into pension and health. You're paying uh, your writer's dues. And then that's also before taxes as well. So you can end up having, you know, 40% of what you made on paper for a couple months, like, taken in, in these different, like, fees that you have to pay to your reps yeah. and everything. So then, you know, it's like, oh, they made on paper like $80,000 for a couple months work when really they're netting like 40000 And then you don't you know. You might not book again. You might not get another show that year. You might not, your show might not get renewed the next year. And then you're back looking for work. So it could be a year and a half, two years before you work your next job. So then that 40000 is $20,000 a year. 
And then for work that know, might get canceled and doesn't And then you're getting like reputation. 42 cents in residuals. Writers are W2, right? I'm just making sure I'm remembering that. Yeah, um, they, I mean, they still have to pay taxes regardless on that income. So well, yeah, yeah, no, I just was saying if they're W2 or if they're self-employed. Uh, it depends. I mean, a lot of writers will uh, get paid through like an LLC. Um, yeah. Like they'll file that way. Um, I've sent a lot of paperwork yeah like you still fill out like the the w2 or like or whatever and the, the i9 yeah, and sure. all of that okay but great. but you know a lot of times yeah they're they're filing as like a a corporation and stuff just to kind of kind of lessen yeah the lessen tax the tax burden can you fill us in before we get to this last point i want to make about actually no let me get to this last point and then i'm going to ask you a really important question to okay kind of round us out so one thing I was thinking about that's in the news right now that's kind of based in my own personal experience as a member of the Writers Guild of America East, um, which in recent years has gone through a lot of turmoil on whether or not it should continue unionizing alongside news staff because there was a big kerfuffle among the TV writers a few years ago where they basically said, you know, the news guilds are taking up so much of our resources and so much of our lawyers' resources, and it's a different beast, and they should just be their own thing, basically. And the WGAE, we had a big vote about this, and this was like a big kerfuffle inside the WGAE. But one of the things that Ted Sarandos is doing, right, he's receiving a slightly less salary this year, but he saw this dramatic increase in 2022. And one of the reasons is because Netflix is contracting a little. They didn't meet their target goals last year. Revenues down. The stock options were down. Temporarily, they saw this dramatic decrease in subscriber counts. And you see someone like Ted Sarandos, who has now botched the writer's strike and destroyed the TV industry and like irreparably damaged the careers of all these writers and actors and producers that Netflix has contracted and stolen IP from, whatnot, what have you, and will probably be the demise of the TV industry if he goes left unchecked. And he gets all this money despite doing what anyone could say a bad job at his job, right? And something you see a lot in the media right now is these dramatic layoffs happening among news writers, right? Who are being laid off in mass by these executives who are saying like, economic headwinds have changed and we just can't afford to pay you anymore. And I want to read one example of my CEO, Nancy Dubuck, in a recent New York Times report from this year before the company filed for bankruptcy last week. Um, Vice's CEO departure signals fallen hopes for digital media. Yeah, this is from February. And I'm just going to read this and tie it into Sarando. So as part of her contract, Nancy Dubuck was granted tens of thousands of shares in Vice, according to a copy of her contract. Because the company is private, selling shares can be a cumbersome process. The shares would be easier to cash in if the company sold or went public. Stock grants are a common incentive offered to employees at startups. Ms. Dubik was also given an annual salary of more than $1.5 million and a hefty sign-on bonus, according to the copy of her contract. In the years since Ms. Dubik joined Vice to lead the company, it has struggled to reach sustained profitability. Last year, the company missed its revenue target of roughly $700 million by about $1 hundred million dollars. Many of Vice's biggest backers, which include Disney and A&E Networks, are no longer expecting to turn profits on their investments they made in the company. In an interview last month about plans to sell or s- sell some or all of the company, Ms. Dubuck said Vice would break even in 2023. And just a short while later, she left the company with her millions of dollars after quietly leaving her position as the head of Vice. And a month after that, the company officially shuttered and went bankrupt. I mean, it still somewhat exists, but laid off the majority of its newsroom, shuttered most of its verticals, and is now operating on skeleton crews after shutting off all of its TV production enterprises. And this person, Nancy Dubuck, after doing a categorically bad job, was paid millions and millions of dollars over the course of her run at Vice, while the average writer at Vice made about $50,000. 
And many of them had to go public with GoFundMes for their surgery costs that were not covered by the health plan. When things would go wrong, they would have to start GoFundMes to, you know, get money for sick relatives or, you know, imminent houselessness situations. And they had to work ceaseless hours for this company, get paid next to nothing. And then in their free time, uh, like what happened with the GMG union and myself, spend all their free time bargaining with these people to just keep doing the absolute bare minimum to keep the company rolling. All these writers that keep this company profitable at what, last year, $600 million, despite not meeting its revenue goals, uh, all these people making that $700 million exist got paid less than the entire salary of the CEO, which is what you see at these executives levels across the Hollywood industry. And it's just interesting that people who do a bad job get paid the most, oh while the God. people who yes. afford them that job Welcome to capitalism, get paid baby. the least. I know. So, Ashlyn, I want to ask you this question because you mentioned it a little bit more recently, and I'd love to have some background on this before we close out. I remember you were just saying about how the writers sometimes have to pay like, you know, X amount to their agent, X amount to their business manager, X amount to the, you know, X, Y, and Z. Can you tell us a little bit about what the recent scuff up was between agents and the Writers Guild over, um, there was some scuffle between them more recently. Am I remembering yeah, that, that correctly? Yeah, that was like in 2019 and that had to do with the, um, the practice of packaging yeah um yeah and it's it's basically like you know these agents and stuff they they would you know like if you're caa or something yeah and there's a project you might try to kind of bundle like your own clients together um as a package deal and then also you uh caa would get a um like a fee on the back end for putting this package together so it was like an incentive for them to to make these packages and like you know like sell them because caa would get this extra like huge amount um that came out of you know like the budget of like the project or or like yeah. you know maybe pay to the writer um and of course, the writers are like, what the fuck? Like, <laughs> you're like screwing me over because it, it they were acting, you know, in their own self-interest and not necessarily what was best creatively for a project or, or yeah. whatever. Um, and I think, you know, of course, you would also hope that by ending packaging that that money would would go towards the production or go towards yeah, the pay of the writers. But, but of course, like it didn't necessarily did that um, money evaporate just from the budgets? They basically were like that extra ex incentive bonus we were going to pay CAA. Did like, that just yeah, fill back I, the salaries I, for other people. I'm sure. I can't tell you like where that money went. I know they came up with some creative accounting to be like, well, that money also like doesn't get to go to you. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Like, I don't know. I don't the know what they did. The extra work of having to talk to you on the phone about this means I get an extra million dollars that yeah. was going to go to CAA. But yeah, so I mean, of course, a lot of writers felt like. Their, their representation maybe wasn't wasn't um working in their best interest when of course like as an agent the difference between like an agent and a manager is an agent has fiduciary duty to you as a client and they can only charge like a certain percent they only get you know 10 percent um but you know so in theory they're earning their income from your income like they're working for yeah. you so that they can also get paid but if they can kind of go behind your back and get yeah. money from like the studios directly, then they don't necessarily need you as much, you know, like yeah. you working as much and they can just sell these packages. But yeah, that's Have kind you, of what that was about. Yeah. And I asked that one, because I was wondering where that money went, if that went back to writers at all. And two, because as we close out, can you tell us anything about what the mood has been like amongst agents with the writer strike? Have you seen solidarity? Have you seen anxiety? Um, I mean, uh, I've seen a lot of, you know, like agents supporting their clients, of course, and like, yeah. uh, you know, coming out to the picket lines and everything. And, you know, they, they do, they do honor, like they can't, they can't talk to executives. They can't talk to, to anyone really about like, 
their clients work and like yeah. even even in like a oh maybe after this is over like they can't discuss anything like that so you know i i've i've seen that um but of course i mean like uh there are all kinds of opinions you know like they don't it just depends like some might not necessarily feel like the writers know what they're talking about like some people like to think you know the writers are are being too demanding or you know whatever of course there's they're still going to support their clients but i think i think for some people it's like uh well you know they're just gonna end up hurting themselves potentially but like but like you do have to take risks in order to like win labor rights you know like yeah they're not stupid and I think one thing I want to leave our listeners with as we close out this episode is, you know, that returning to the idea of like the bourgeois concerns of the writer strike, you know, like you're saying these agents saying like maybe these people don't really know what they're talking about or like, you know, writers really don't know what it is that's going on behind the scenes, right? Like the actors don't really know what's going on behind the scenes. They're not in it with us, the agents and the producers and the executives in these rooms, you know. Just because someone gets paid more money than you to do a job does not mean they should be exploited. And it doesn't mean you should be exploited either. And I think that's something that gets lost in all of this is that idea that like, it's okay for writers to get exploited because they get paid too much money as it is, right? But what we're arguing for now is not everybody making less money to match the like worst conditions in America. It's everyone should make more money and we should be paid well to do it. And we should be treated fairly and have things that we deserve to live comfortable lives. In especially, a especially when you have so to, much wealth. especially, yeah. you know, you're an LA writer, you have to live in Los Angeles and yeah. it's like, you can't afford, you're doing all this work. You can't afford to live in the city that you're yeah. producing work in. Which should be true for everyone. Yeah. I cut my thought off there. I'm not advocating for capitalism. I'm just saying in a country that (laughs) generates so much wealth, the fact that the people who generate all that wealth see none of it is a problem. And I'm not saying we should have more wealth. I'm just saying we should all live comfortably and these studios want to make sure we don't. So Exactly. Matt, you got any closing thoughts for us? You want to scream into the void? I do want to scream into the void because all of this is just the same shit that happens in every single fucking industry in capitalism. Like, welcome to working in America. Race to the bottom. Everyone suffers. Investors still see that line go up and their bank accounts get fatter. I fucking hate it. <laughs> like, I just... We all face... We're all facing the economic headwinds that the executives are riding off in on their private jets. Like, like actually, We're left to stand out in the freezing wind while the executives are like off to Turks and Caicos. Like, like as all of our bank accounts dry up from like a pack of eggs costing fifteen dollars, like these private jets are still moving quite freely and quite easily. Yeah, with it. Yeah, because the labor is still being gen is still generating profit. I just saw pictures somebody. of Jeff Bezos. You know, speaking of Amazon Studios, Jeff Bezos on his five hundred million dollar yacht, like sunbathing with his you know, wife. Whatever. <laughs> a I'm yacht, just, a single a yacht, yacht that is more than what the writers are. And you know, the, and we've yeah. seen below deck. Single yacht. We've seen below deck. That five hundred million dollar yacht costs like a hundred million a week to maintain. <laughs> It's, it's just disgusting. <laughs> Off with their it's heads. It's disgusting. Off with their Well, thank you heads. all for thank you all for joining us for a supersized episode of Eating for Free. We had so much to talk about with Ashlyn, and we all love having Ashlyn around. And we haven't gotten to record with you in such a long time. I so. know. It's been really nice to talk to you, and I'm sorry we went so overboard. But the writer strike is a big deal. No, I mean, yeah, you I'm can't sh- minimize it. I'm sure I left out like so much stuff. Um I definitely did, but we yeah, all did. there's definitely, a ton, there's a ton to talk about for here. time. You know, if we talked about everything, we'd be here for three hours, which people yeah. might love. I'm not sure. Maybe we'll I mean, do a telethon. <laughs> we'll get some writer friends together and we'll do an eating for free telethon oh, <laughs> until God. like midnight. Um, for some housekeeping, once again, uh, we're going to have sh- friend of the show, Shamira, on next week to talk about the hidden lives of Vanderpump Rules cast members. So tune in next week for that. We're going to have Shamira on in a few weeks after. After that, in June, to talk about this season of Vanderpump Rules, specifically the finales that are airing. We're recording just amid, I think, as the 
the finale, finale of going right Vanderpump now, Rules mm-hmm. airs mm-hmm. currently, which we won't be able to watch until tomorrow. Thanks, Peacock. Um, reminder also that we have a bunch of bonus content up on Patreon. You can go to patreon.com backslash eating for free to get our bonus episodes as well as bonus episodes of a side project that I'm running right now with friend of the show, Alex V. Green, called Beautiful Women Updates, which is a weekly sex in the city discussion, sexy, beautiful women talking about sexy, beautiful women podcast that's just a fun side project we run alex publishes it on their patreon and we publish it on ours as just a thank you letter to all of the people who support us make the show happen and just something fun to do um we will be off in july so we will have bonus episodes through july but there will be no mind feet episodes so if you're gonna miss us go subscribe and get all of that lovely lovely content library and we just Thank Ashlyn so much for being here. Ashlyn, is there anything you want to plug anywhere you want to listen to us anywhere you want us to listen to you on any other podcasts that you've been doing? Um, I mean, there will be a somewhat similar episode, I think, uh, on the Big Story Naturals pod, shout out to them, where I'm also a guest. Um, but yeah, I mean, like support the writers. Um, don't fucking try and break in now. Like, don't think that this is your time to like, be a writer um and like <laughs> cross the picket line um and uh i mean you can like you can as a non non-union member like join join the picket lines you can support um you can support the writers and uh, obviously if you're not anywhere near a picket line or don't want to do that you can also donate to the um entertainment community fund formerly the actors fund but um that's what you know a lot of writers will be depending on during the strike. Um, so if you do feel like um, getting involved, you can donate there. I'm sure they'd appreciate it. Um, yeah. But for myself, I don't really have a lot else to plug. Um, you can uh, catch, I guess, the latest season of Ted Lasso, where I'm famously the showrunner. <laughs> uh, so I have all of this inside knowledge. Um, Just forget get so... all our Jason Sudeikis tea. It's all. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for I, everything we've ever yeah, said about me. Jason Sudeikis and Olivia Wilde just came straight from you. Yeah. You're as right the there. showrunner. You're in the thick mm-hmm. of it. Um, yeah. I, I also want to just add, as we get out of here, that if you are a writer in the Writers Guild of America and you'd love to talk to us about your experiences on the picket line and in the last few weeks, um, please email us at eatingforfreepodcast at gmail.com. We'd love to talk to you and maybe have you on, um, maybe have a few of you on. Um, just really, please, we would urge you guys, even if you just want to share an anecdote or get a message out to our followers and listeners, we'd love to hear from you. So email us once again, eatingforfreepodcast at gmail.com. And with that, I'm going to count us out, guys. So on the count of three, Let's three. Do it. Two, Two, one, one. good Good. Bye. bye. You've been listening to Eating for Free, which is written and hosted by myself, Joan Summers, and Matthew Lawson, and produced by Ashlyn Thomas and myself, with music from our friend Pluto. For more information about this episode and our show, go to eatingforfree.com. And if you want weekly bonus episodes, go to patreon.com backslash eatingforfree, which helps support this show and keep it going. We've also got merch at eatingforfree.com backslash merch. Merch.